Uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Cup of Joe. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Sheikh. I have the honor of serving as the Associate Athletic Director for Development. Uh, I am glad there are many of you from all across the state, the region, and the U.S. joining us. Uh, special thanks to Kathy Barnard for asking me to moderate today's uh, session. Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge uh, University of Idaho Athletics Hall of Famer Kathy Clark, who's with us. Uh, yeah. Kathy was a longtime administrator for the athletic department, uh, leaving us as a senior woman administrator. So Kathy is residing now up north, and it's good to see her in attendance. And I know that Kelly was one of our former student athletes, so I, it must be a joy to see a uh, student athlete out there doing great things. Absolutely. We've got a lot of them. <laughs> we do have a lot of them, that's right. Uh, special thanks to uh, the program sponsor, Payne West Insurance. Uh, Payne West is the leading broker in the Pacific Northwest uh, where vandals can shop for home insurance, auto insurance, and much more. Every new policy supports the University of Idaho Alumni Association. So before uh, we get started and start uh, asking Kelly some uh, questions, remember to mute yourself. Uh, if you have any questions for Kelly, uh, please chat uh, or send them through the chat, I should say, to Sandy Larson. Sandy's going to monitor the questions and we'll be able to ask them to Kelly when we are through with our uh, set questions. So Kelly, uh, in May, you were kind enough to help the uh, athletic department with a uh, public service announcement. It's when this thing uh, called COVID uh, was starting to become more and more of reality. And in that PSA, you talked about New terminology, you talked about social distancing, which uh, Jeff Pilcher thought was uh, only happening at Moscow Junior High dances, but uh, became part of our norm and wearing masks and, and you know taking your temperature and washing your hands and all that good stuff. But where has uh, Kelly been uh, during the pandemic and how she survived? Well, I've been in this room a lot, a lot. I was doing shows from here and uh, taping Zoom. Uh, interviews and podcasts and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and it, I definitely, like so many Americans, uh, have been affected by uh, COVID and this pandemic because NBC Sports, uh, which I was I was a part of their regional networks for 17 years, starting in D.C. and then going to Houston for a couple quick years and then coming out here to the Bay Area. Uh, they had multiple rounds of layoffs, so I was one of them. Um, they went after some of us long, long time employees, as you can imagine that that made more sense to them uh, financially, <laughs> because our, our industry has been hit pretty hard by COVID uh, with a lack of fans in the stands and uh, a lot of games and seasons being shortened. So um, I worked the baseball season. It all happened when Giants started. I do the pre and post game show or I did the pre and post game show. So I was a host of that and I did that. Um, I was the only one in studio. All my analysts ended up doing all the games from their homes in Arizona and up in wine. I had them all over the country, Chicago. So it was a very inter interesting situation because I was locked in literally an office for the season. And then I would mask up and go to the studio and I'd be alone. There was no one in the studio with very limited number of people. I couldn't see my producer who was new. So I was like kind of helping him learn the Giants thing. And uh, I did all the shows for that 60 game season um, and the Giants unfortunately just missed the playoffs. So um, that was it. I was done. I was basically laid off right after uh, baseball season. So I have been, you know, just kind of pivoting into real estate right now um, and doing some freelance. I did uh, freelance uh, Sunday with the Pac-12 Network uh, for Women's College Hoops, was, which was fun. And um, I did some radio, sports radio but um, I'm looking to stay in San Francisco. So uh, I bought a place in North Beach, which is the Italian section of the city, which I love. And my parents, uh, obviously they're in Idaho and all my family. And I just kind of want to stay close by after going across the country uh, to DC and back. So yeah, I'm kind of in a weird place like so many Americans kind of reinventing myself and, and hoping to stay in sports, but also looking to pay the bills with real estate, which here in the Bay Area is very good. And I have a great friend who's a broker. So that's kind of what I've been doing, just studying a lot right now and taking this uh, three college course for real estate. Good for you. Good for you. You mentioned your uh, your, your parents, that they're living in Southern Idaho, but uh, they spent some time in Moscow and that's where you grew up. So talk about your mom and dad, their ties to sports and how you and your brother drone uh, got involved in sports? Well, I mean, I think it was pretty much um, 
going to happen regardless. <laughs> um, you know, born into a sports family. My parents are both uh, athletes and uh, PE teachers and coaches. They met uh, in the field house as, as PE teachers and coaches um, at Moscow Junior High. Um, so my dad, obviously, longtime uh, varsity baseball coach. My mom was a long-term, long-time gymnastics coach for the junior high, which they didn't even have a program in Idaho. So her teams always had, always had to travel to Spokane, Washington to compete. And they were very good. Um, and I just grew up in the gym, going to, to work with them every day, whether it was tumbling early in the morning with my mom and her teams um, or on the baseball field as a back girl. And my brother, of course, played baseball for my dad. And um, I played a ton of, of baseball and fast pitch and but I fell in love with basketball. That was kind of like just my love. I knew at a very young age that that was the sport I really wanted to play. But otherwise, I played everything. I played all the sports and, and my parents, you know, it, it was helpful in the fact that they were coaches, even though they had their own team. So they couldn't always be there. But for the most part, as teachers, you know, they were able to really support my athletic career. So it was kind of a no brainer. People always go, well, how did you get into sports? I'm like, how did I not get into sports? I mean, it literally is the dinner table conversation. And my dad and I still to this day have very heated debates about sports. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and uh, I'm glad I did it because it's been kind of an experience that my, my family has been able to um, live through with me, all my different stops. My mom and I were laughing actually the other night talking about how my dad's closet is literally like a step in my career, like my journey of sports television. Every market I've been in, he has t-shirts, hats, jackets you know from Houston with the Astros and of course Texas Rangers when I was down there in Austin and I ended up coming back to Houston to St. Louis and the Cardinals which happened to be my favorite team growing up to uh you know the Nationals and Baltimore Orioles and the Texans back in Houston and then of course the Giants here and the A's and the Warriors and so it's pretty funny you can see where I've been based on my father's closet now, now, did your dad have a favorite baseball team growing up that he followed and, and were you able to work in one of those markets or did you have to shift his, uh, his allegiance? Yeah. Oh, well, he grew up in Seattle. So he, he was a Mariners fan. Um, obviously when he was a kid, the Mariners were not there, but he, you know, huge baseball, him and his twin brother collected baseball cards and knew every team and knew every stat. They're like walking encyclopedias. Um, but the, the Mariners were certainly his team. He loved the Cleveland Indians when he was a kid um, so I got to do my internships in Seattle. That's how I started in the, in the business. My cousin, Cammie is a news anchor and she is from Seattle, worked her way back home to Seattle. So I did some internships in the summer, um, with her station, which was North, Northwest cable news. And then I did King five, which is the NBC station. The next summer I worked at my uncle's golf course and, and stayed with them. Um, so yeah, Seattle, I grew up going to Mariner games and the Sonics were my favorite team growing up and, and Seahawks, of course, uh, even though I liked the St. Louis Cardinals as a baseball team because of Ozzy Smith, but, um, yeah, my dad played baseball obviously at Idaho. So, um, and he's in the hall of fame with his, his baseball team as well. So yeah, that, that's his team, but he tend, tend to obviously follow all the teams I was covering and then support them. Um, as well, even even within the division with uh, like the A's, but um, yeah, he's he's uh, he's definitely a Mariners fan. So you uh, grew up in Moscow, went to Moscow High School, a lot of success at Moscow High School, particularly in uh, basketball. Um, talk about that success, and then obviously talk about what that recruitment process was like for you and your family. So, um, yeah, we had a lot of talent, um, basketball talent in, in, in Moscow. I mean, from a very young age, uh, I was a little vandal, which is kind of one of the things that really got me going with my ball handling skills, performing at half times. And we got to perform during a, a Chicago Bulls, Portland Trail Blazers game when Michael Jordan was at the you know prime of his career. So that was a lot of fun. And um, and that led to a U ball and a lot of uh just all my, all my good friends, we were all into basketball. And so we started, I do, I used to do camps every summer. I would do multiple camps. Then I would travel for AAU into on these all-star teams started to get involved with the Spokane stars. Uh, when I got older around my eighth grade year, I think, but, but we had a lot of teams from Moscow that played uh, in Yakima for the AAU tournaments. So that's really kind of where it started. And I think from a very, when I was a seventh grader, I'm um, Sally Green was the head coach, the varsity head coach. 
at Moscow High and, and she was already eyeing me and Heather Owen, who of course um, played at Stanford. Uh, you know, everybody knows Heather, 6'4", redhead, can't miss her, um, extremely talented athlete. So between the two of us, we started kind of excelling. And, and by the time we were freshmen, we got invited to both try out for the varsity team um, and we both made it. And then from there, um, I started as a, as a freshman and Heather uh, came off the bench. She certainly could have started, but we did actually have a lot of tall talent. Um, Barbara Hudson, of course, who went to St. Mary's, um, Jill Morris, who went to Idaho with me. We had a lot of talent. So uh, we ended up my sophomore year going on a streak where we basically, we moved down a level. So we were at the high level in, in, in Idaho moved down a level and then just completely dominated. I wish we would have stayed with Coeur d'Alene and been able to play all the, the better teams in Idaho, but we won three straight titles. Um, I don't know if we lost, I don't think we lost a, I don't think we lost any of our like games um, outside of a few to Coeur d'Alene, which was out of our division. So yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. We dominated and um, the first one as a sophomore was probably the most memorable just because we were good, but we didn't know how good. And I remember we didn't shave our legs the entire run. So when we won it all, I think it was in post falls. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember now there's so many games. Our parents had little teddy bears with razors on them because it was very needed that we needed to shave because we, it was like a thing. It was a bonding thing that we all did. I don't know whose idea it was, but, and then by the time I was a senior, um, you know, Heather and I capped it off with another, another championship before we went to college. So I had a chance to see Heather a couple of holidays ago and I asked her what it was like to not be admitted into the University of Idaho and how to settle for that school called Stanford. So that, that was a little fun having a little, little back yeah. and forth with her. Yeah, I know. They just wasn't good enough for Idaho. I don't know yeah. what happened. Yeah, Maybe one day, maybe one day she can look back. <laughs> it, tell us besides the uh, University of Idaho, who else was recruiting you? So it was interesting. I kind of got caught in a weird place. I mean, I was recruited by a lot of big West schools, um, at big sky, um, West coast, uh, West Con coast conference schools, Oregon at one point in time, Wazoo across the street didn't seem to think that there could be that many, uh, division one talent coming out of, of Moscow. The head coach at the time, um, didn't think that there could be, um, that much talent, which there was, we had multiple division one athletes. So I didn't get much, uh, I didn't get much attention from Wazoo, despite going over to Bowler gym and playing every summer pickup ball with all the guys and football players and all their talent over there. But, um, I ended up kind of like, so my junior year, I was the state MVP, but my junior year, the state messed up the timing for recruiting. And so nobody could come watch me in the state title or the state, state tournament. So that was my, you know, you usually want your junior year to be most visible. Um, so that hurt me, I think a little bit in terms of some of the Pac-12 teams or Pac-10 at the time. But um, I ended up going to Boise State for a recruiting trip and June Doherty was a head coach then, loved June Doherty, would have killed to play for, did not want to be a Boise State Bronco, uh, loved their facilities, hated the idea, um, growing up in a Vandal family and really wanted a college experience more than anything. Um, and I went to Idaho State on, on a recruiting trip um, and I, I committed early. Um, you know, you have the two different committing uh, periods. I did it before the season because I was just worried about, you know, you just don't want to have an injury that could potentially take a full ride scholarship away from you. So I recruit, I did early. I, I, I will be honest, UCLA came calling after I'd already committed and I would have loved to go to UCLA just because California, LA, it just seems like, you know, it's LA. I mean, it would have been fun, but I'd already committed to Idaho, but I think it was all meant to be like Idaho. I know now that that was my, that was my journey, my destiny that I was meant to walk because they recruited me since I was a seventh grader back when you could recruit, like I was getting letters when I was a seventh grader. Now you can't do that. It's illegal, but, um, but they'd always been there. My dad had a health scare and had an emergency bypass and they sent flowers and they were very, very supportive. Obviously there were a lot of promises made to me. They delivered on most of them. Um, and my parents got to see my career. And so it was, it was all meant to be, you know, that I, I didn't want to, cause I, I'm a big city person, as you can tell all the places I've lived, I really haven't gone back to um, small town, but I, uh, 
I knew I was going to leave Idaho pretty quickly after college. So it worked out because my parents were able to be there the whole time and at least see my home games. So um, I, you know, and, and of course I'm second generation Vandal. So it was meant to be. Good for you. And, and you joined the sorority. You were in the Gamma Phi house. Obviously you, you were working towards your degree. You earned a degree. Uh, you're extremely competitive and, and uh, earned uh, numerous records as a student athlete uh, on the court. How did you balance the life of a student athlete? And what was that like uh, maybe for those on the call that don't know the, all the ins and outs of what the student athlete experience is about? I mean, it's hard. It's hard. You got to You got to really love it. I mean, when they say you get to college and they say sports is kind of a job, I mean, it really is like, it is that kind of a commitment because you are earning, especially on a full ride scholarship, you are earning your degree through, through basketball. And, and Julie Holt was a very tough coach. Um, every, for four years, I had weights at six in the morning, six thirty in the morning, three to four times a, a week, three days during the season, four days outside of the season. And you did not show up late or you, you basically had to run. And then if you ran a ton of suicides, the next time you were late, your teammates would run and you would watch them. And that would be the most torture. And then the third time you lose your scholarship. So you really didn't mess around with Julie when it came to missing um, or being late to anything. So, I mean, it was just, I remember my freshman year, you know, between your individual workouts, your weight sessions, your three hour practices in which we really did run and run and run the entire time. And she ran a lot. We had a lot of conditioning suicides, sweet, sweet 16s, 10, eight sixes will haunt me forever. Um, but you know, between that and then trying to balance a sorority, which is very hard because they have a lot of commitments they want you to make to them. And I didn't have all that much time in the day. I would get up at five in the morning to do my chore, which was like vacuuming or cleaning a bathroom or cleaning something. I would get up at five to do that and then have to go to weights. So I was pretty gassed my freshman year. I remember I was so sports anemic by my Christmas time. I could barely pick up my feet. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, I had to, you know, go on some iron. I found out I was iron deficient and all that. But um, I started doing like uh, sports psychology, mental toughness training because I just needed it. I, I kind of almost lost the love of the game because I was so exhausted but then you, you learn how to balance your time. You learn how to get more sleep. I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was like queen of taking a 10 hour power nap. Like I could do that in the locker room at, right in between practice and a class. But by my, by the time I was a you know, senior, I wanted another season. Like I didn't want it to end. Like I knew how to take care of myself. I knew how to balance it all, but it is hard. I mean, you do make sacrifices. I didn't have the social life that you know, a lot of students in college did um, because I couldn't, I couldn't survive if I went out and I tried to party a little or have a little too much fun. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't make it the next day. So um, yeah, it was, you know, I graduated in four years. Part of me wishes I would have taken that fifth year and just had a light load and just been a student for, you know, a year. Everyone told me to do it. And I was like, ah, I'm ready to go. Let's go. I want a job. I want to get out there and find a TV gig and and now I'm like, why did I rush into the real world? I mean, it's always going to wait for you. So uh, it's going to be there. So um, it was definitely, I mean, in sports television and all the moves I've made, I mean, that discipline has certainly helped me in being able to survive a lot of different scenarios um, in, in what I deal with now, including right now in a pandemic. So it was, um, it was an amazing experience though. I mean, it, it made me who I am today. So you have a great... Uh... Julie Holt story, and, and, and I'm hoping we can maybe combine a couple questions as far as what it was like playing for Julie Holt and one of your most memorable experiences as a basketball player at Idaho. Um, yeah, Julie was, as I said, tough, and she definitely prepared all of us for the real world, um, but she was also very loving and kind of motherly in a sense, like she would take, you know, us to her house on the weekends and have, we'd have like a pancake feast or she'd cook, you know, a dinner for us, a team dinner. Or we did some excursions. I remember when we came through San Francisco, she took us, we were here for, to play USF and she took all of us out for this horseback riding in the hills somewhere. And we got to ride horses for a couple hours, um, which was amazing. 
Uh, so we went to obviously University of Hawaii. We went there for the tournament, uh, Thanksgiving tournament, which was fun. So it was, it was, she was kind of like the Bobby Knight of women's basketball. She was a yeller. And, and we used to joke, like, if you want to know what we're doing, just listen to our coach. Cause she might tell you the play. <laughs> Cause she was usually like, she just kind of was so into it. She was like, you know, telling us all where to, and we're like, we got it. We got it. But she, um, yeah, so she was, she was very tough on us. Um, and she was particularly tough on me. Um, she expected me to be first in every line, me and Ari, we had to be first in every uh, sprint, first for every drill. It, yeah, if we were not, she knew that, you know, we weren't giving it everything we had. She, um, she would always tell me like, the, the moment I'm not yelling at you is a moment you should be worried. Like that's when I don't expect much more from you. So if I'm expecting a lot from you, that's a good thing. Um, and I think probably the most memorable would definitely be her, I guess it was my junior year, had to be my junior year. She was very, very pregnant. And I mean, very pregnant. And people, every time we would go into a game, they thought she was gonna give birth like right there on the sideline, which I wouldn't have been surprised because she yells a lot, could have popped her you know, water. Uh, it did not happen, but she did go into labor the morning of the Boise St State game. And it was in Moscow. And I think it was a Sunday. So it was like an early day game and she went to labor and her nanny was literally giving play. And, and at the time we didn't have cell phones. So she, you could see her back in the corner uh, by the office over there in, in uh, the gym memorial. And she was on the phone play by play to Julie while Julie was in labor having a C-section um, because I found out she actually was so big because she had like a grapes fruit sized, you know, mass in there with the baby that was competing. So we found out why she was so big, uh, but she was getting play by play during our game. And I hit the game winner in the last few seconds, drove down the lane, hit the game winner. And um, yeah. And then I think she was like back to work the next day. I don't know. It, it seemed like she missed no time, but we did joke that I should have been named or Ben should have been named after me because I hit the game winner against, you know, Boise state while she was in labor. But Nick, little Nick was my little buddy. He was my shadow. I can't believe he's like, I think he's engaged and graduated from college. He's like, but he was my shadow. He followed me everywhere. He ran lines with me. Um, he was just my little buddy um, before, you know, Ben was born. That's great. That's, and what a wonderful family. But, oh, know, yeah. They're great. They're in Italy right now. I'm so jealous. It's like my favorite country and they're over there and Nick's coaching. So on the academic side, uh, did you have a favorite professor or two? And, and what did you like about them? Um, well, Glenn, I want to say concert, but it's not Glenn concert because that's who I used to work with uh, in DC. Uh, he was um, basically the it was kind of like a communications. I used to work. Um, so the TV station there on campus, he and I kind of worked out a new, cause we didn't really have a broadcast major at the time. And so he would do these public radio, um, actual hits for public radio. And he would record in, in the, the audio studio there for those. And then he also taught a bunch of um, courses for the communication school. So he and I actually started to work out like, ways for me to get credit, but also experience in the broadcast. So he started to create kind of some broadcast classes um, for, uh, for me and for other students that wanted to do television. We pulled out some of the old equipment uh, and learned how to shoot. There were like three quarter inch decks that you had to carry. And then the camera, it was like insane. I actually had to use one of those in my first job. So it did help me out. Um, but yeah, we would create all these courses and then he let me actually do some live reads for a recorded reads for the public radio station there that helped me re really with my delivery. Um, Glenn Mosley, sorry, I was wanted to confuse with all the Glens in my life um, since then. Um, yeah, so he would let me record and helped me with my delivery, which was really big. Uh, that between in my internships you know, really kind of prepared me. And they also helped me in the search for, you know, a job my senior year. I started to put together tapes and started to look through tvjobs.com at the time. It was a source that he belonged to as well. And so um, I would probably say Glenn because he was just kind of like, we, I, I feel like they've done a lot more with the communication broadcast school there since then. Um, 
because it really was kind of the beginning of a lot of people wanting to do the same thing. So in, in the chat, uh, Mosley came up a few times. So that's who you're probably refer referring yeah, to, Mosley. Mosley yeah. And yeah. You, you know, we got kind of another distinguished guest who's a student at the University of Idaho, but he's also the voice of the Moscow Bears and Zach Kellogg. And and I know your 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 niece mm -hmm. is a freshman at Idaho. So if you could go back and tell uh, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old Kelly one or two things besides stay that extra year and enjoy college for that fifth year, what would it be? And maybe some of our students on here can uh, can learn from you. Okay, well, if I could tell myself one thing, gosh. Um, I think, you know, it kind of goes along the same lines of, of don't rush, like don't be in too big of a hurry to, you know, just, I mean, it was good that I had the, the drive that I had, um, which certainly came from my family, my parents and, and my athletic career to just keep pushing. Cause in our industry and in, in TV, you really got to be aggressive and you got to keep going and going and, and getting that next job and, and moving on to the next phase. And, and you have to have the confidence to do it. Um, but I think I, I didn't stop and enjoy some of the moments enough. Like I was just so busy on what's next, what's next. Or I was, I'm such, and this is actually a big big thing I, I still battle and, and would definitely tell my, my uh, old self to, you know, just to give yourself a break. I'm such a perfectionist. In fact, Julie, that was like the thing that, that I struggled with the most in basketball was enjoying the moment in the games because I expected so much of myself. And if I made a mistake, I wanted to be the best, you know, I just, I couldn't enjoy the moment. And I think I've done that in TV too. You know, I've covered Super Bowls and I've covered some amazing things, but I'm so focused on, you know, being prepared and I'm an, o I over-prepare. And I think a lot of women in our industry certainly do and we need to because we're judged differently. But, you know, I didn't always stop and be like, wow, this is really fun. You Sometimes I'd have to remind myself like, hey, smile, have fun. You're, you're you know, you're at the World Series. You're, you know, you're at the Super Bowl. You're covering an, an all-star game. You're covering the NBA finals and the Golden State Warriors, which that's all they are is fun. So, you know, I, I learned that along the way, but, but I know like when I was in college, we did this team, team bonding thing where we went out into the woods somewhere and and coach had, it, we had like life coaches or something. So we each had to pick something that we struggled with and, and being a perfectionist was what I struggled with. We had to write it on a board and then we had to punt, they taught us how to punch through the board. And then you carried that, you know, home as kind of a reminder to break through your struggle. So um, it's always been a struggle for me, but I think I would continue to tell my younger self, you just got to stop, smell the roses, have some fun, enjoy the moment and don't, don't take it so seriously. Like, you know, life is, there's serious enough moments in life as we know with this pandemic, but um, yeah, enjoying those moments that are um, pressure filled, um, but fun. Yeah, that, that's great advice, not only for college students, but for any of us, thank you. Yeah, yeah and I want to be a, a, a <laughs> fan for a second, Kelly. I want to know who are some uh, celebrities, professional athletes, professional coaches that, that you've had the opportunity to interview, work with, uh, who, who are some that kind of stick out as memorable moments or folks that you just kind of, you know, took a step back and were like, wow, I just interviewed so-and-so or right. wow, I'm in the same room. Because I, I think there's got to be a part of you that's a fan uh, when you're having these conversations as well. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of lose a little of that fandom when you, when you've been in the business for a while, but but certainly, I mean, I have been really fortunate to cover a lot of Hall of Famers and uh, big games and big moments. Um, you know, I going back to like my St. Louis days in which I was a Cardinals fan growing up because of Ozzie Smith. I loved uh, Whitey Ball and, and those teams with Vince Coleman and William McGee and Ozzie was a shortstop like me. My dad was a shortstop. And then he, he also did the roundup back tuck out to the field. That was the gymnastics part of my life. Um, so I was drawn to him at a very young age. So when I was in St. Louis, I got to meet um, Ozzy when he was going to the hall of fame as well. Um, but all the, all the greats from Bob Gibson to Stan Musial to, um, again, Ozzy to Whitey Herzog, who was the, the famed manager. Um, I got to meet a lot of those guys, which was cool for me. Now, not, if you're not into baseball, that might not be super cool, but one of the coolest moments was going into Stan Musial's home, 
uh, when he was still, you know, hadn't kind of, he was still kind of like with it. Um, and he is, you know, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, Hall of Famer and uh, Stan the Man usual. I got to sit there and I had no idea how cool it was. My dad, you know, was probably like, do you understand how amazing this moment is? Um, but, you know, getting to sit down and do a long format interview with him when I was early 20s well, was something I really appreciate now. I don't know if I totally appreciated the magnitude of that moment then. Um, and then of course, I mean, I've covered again, like Tom Brady, the Patriots, I covered both of their losses in the Super Bowl to the Giants, which is interesting. Um, I've co covered four uh, Super Bowls total, but uh, the greatest show on turf, I was in St. Louis covering Marshall Falk, Kurt Warner, Kurt Warner is still, Brenda Warner, they're still friends of mine um, that I got to know them very well and their family. Um, and then um, more recently, I'm trying to think if I'm missing, I mean, DC, I covered the, the Washington football team now for eight seasons. Joe Gibbs, uh, his return, um, Clinton Portis, all the interesting storylines that went through that team. Um, but probably the coolest thing for me is having covered the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, my Palouse guy. I always give my Wazoo guy you know, a little grief. Um, and Steve Kerr could not be any better. Um, I think that entire organization, top to bottom, um, is just they're the best. I mean, they just, they get it. They have fun. They treat the media with, res with respect. Um, all that, you know, Draymond Green, uh, he, he's about as colorful as it gets, but I got to cover all five NBA finals um, and was traveling and doing a show called the happy hour for the, for the last couple, three, I guess. Um, so getting to cover those three championship runs, uh, cause I got here just in time for that, um, was really cool getting to know some of the players, getting to you know, interview them. I mean, they are, they just, I can't say enough about them. Like there are certain people, certain athletes you see in the world and you're like, they're too good to be true. They're not that great. They can't be that great. I'd say Kurt Warner is one. He is everything. And then some, I'd say Steph, Steph Curry is another. Uh, he really is as good as he seems. Um, and Steve Curry, and it's really a top down. I think you guys in business, you, you know, great organizations based on the top. It's a trickle down. Mm -hmm. So if it's run really well, ownership, I think it, it just naturally flows down. And that's the Warriors. I covered the Washington football team, which is one of the worst organizations I've ever been around. I've never been treated worse. And it is what it is. Um, and then, you know, covered, I think, the best organization in pro sports, from the Lakeubs down to Bob Meyer, who is the, the GM, to Steve Kerr, and to those players and the leaders that they have in that locker room. I mean, it's just, I've been very fortunate to, to get here just in time for all that because I certainly will never forget that. I mean, there's nothing more electric or there, I don't know if I'll ever experience more electric um, energy in a, in a building than Oracle um, when, the, when the Warriors were in their, their height of their prime uh, and, and winning championships. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. And to, to the audience, if you can uh, Please submit your questions in the chat line. We're going to get to them here in a second. Uh, Sandy will be able to, to bring those forward. Uh, I, I guess, uh, Kelly, you know, we kind of are, are working our way to uh, March Madness. Uh, we're officially in March now, and, and the uh, tournaments are going to start here uh, at the conference level and then work its way to the NC2A level. And it's going to be a lot different, obviously, due to the pandemic and uh, the, the fan experience is, is going to be different, but any rituals from your end uh, that you like to do around March Madness and any uh, moments you like to share, I guess, uh, with, with that theme, uh, what gets you excited about March Madness and, and what are you most looking forward to? I mean, just, man, the first couple of rounds, there's just nothing better, like just back-to-back wall-to-wall games. Um, I mean, I not going to happen this year, but I love going just to and it, I've covered a lot, so I haven't always been able to, or I've been in studio working on a day where I think the first day of the tournament, I always want off because I want to go to a sports bar with my friends and I want to just sit there and watch, you know, wall to wall games with some cocktails or drinks and, you know, eat bad bar food um, and just enjoy the upsets. You know, you fill your brackets out, you put some money down. Um, you know, that's, I think the best, like, I, I love those first couple of days where it's just wall to wall games. Um, and then, you know, obviously as the tournament goes on, I covered 
one of the greatest Cinderella stories was George Mason, men, uh, back in 2006, I think. And uh, that was when I was in DC. Jim Laranega was a coach, nicest man um, ever. So got to cover that team. Didn't cover them all the way to the final four because I was actually covering the women that year, the Maryland women, which Brenda Fries is one of the greatest coaches uh, in the women's game. And uh, that, that season I covered the Maryland women and they had like, I think three, two freshmen and three sophomores starting or whatever. They were just an underclass team. No one expected them to do anything and they ended up winning it all in Boston. So I covered them all the way through uh, the, the final four in Boston um, when they beat Duke. And it was just an unlikely story. And being with that team the whole way from Brenda the Freeze's house when you know they had uh, selection Sunday, or I guess it's Monday, I think for women, um, was, was a lot of fun. So between George Mason and seeing the campus of George Mason just go nuts. I mean, seeing these kids that are playing, you know, in a small uh, conference that no one pays any attention to be one of the greatest Cinderella, if not one of the greatest Cinderella to make it all the way to the final four was, was pretty cool as well. Well, thank you. And, uh, we won't have you make any predictions. We'll just uh, enjoy it <laughs> with you from a distance. Yeah, I'm too into the pro game now. It's actually hard right. for me to make predictions on March Madness. People ask me to help them with their bracket. And I'm like, I really like, I go now and guess on the brackets half the time because I just don't watch enough college basketball. So uh, final question for me, uh, Kelly, before we, we turn over to Sandy, uh, you, you're, you're in the Idaho Athletics Hall of Fame. Um, you grew up in Moscow, you went to the University of Idaho, you're, you're a vandal through and through. But I imagine in your travels to Houston and D.C. and now in the Bay Area, folks probably ask you, tell me about the University of Idaho. And, and I guess, how do you tell how do you tell that story? How do you sell the university to them? Well, I mean, you know, I'm sure you guys know that the jokes with Idaho, when you go elsewhere, like it's all about potatoes and, um, you know, things like that. Uh, but people do in our industry know about the Palouse. They, they mostly know about, you know, they've, they've all stayed at the university inn because they've all been to, to Pullman for something with Wazoo um, or, you know, I've talked to people that have been, you know, recruited and that were college athletes and then ended up getting into you know sports television that will tell me their crazy stories of coming on a recruiting trip to Idaho and seeing the cows when you drive in you know you're like yep that's that's Idaho and you know the holes in the side and all the craziness that goes on with the agricultural school but um you know I think a lot of people they they don't know much of Idaho it's it's amazing how many people don't actually even know where the state is like when you're back east it's like they don't they think it's um the Midwest, they don't realize that it really is kind of more West Coast, especially where Moscow is. It's right there on the border. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I obviously, I tell them it, it's it, everything you want in a college experience um, in terms of the Greek system and the campus life. And, um, you know, when I was there, obviously the football team wasn't, they were really good before I got to college. Um, and they were obviously one double A and then they made the move of Boise State to try and go division. That was a little bit hard from a financial standpoint to keep up with a lot of those schools. Um, I think the only thing I probably missed was having those really big football games where, you know, that it's a packed house. I mean, everybody wants that. You When I covered UT, I covered University of Texas, my second job when I lived in Austin, which was amazing to watch just a university like that, the kind of like support the, the, the athletic programs get and the amount of money that the alumni give, it's insane. It's a whole nother world. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I had everything I wanted in a career. I mean, I, I know a lot of, uh, I had friends that, you know, I mean, even my, my girlfriend had their own, she went to Stanford, Stanford's amazing. I mean, you couldn't ask for also a better college experience, but I did get the, I did get the benefit of going to Idaho and starting all four years. Had I gone to a Pac-10, Pac-12 team, I probably wouldn't have started until I was a junior. Um, so for me, my experience at Idaho, and I just tell people, yeah, it's a beautiful state. It, you know, if you actually want clean air and and freshwater lakes, I always brag about like Lake McCall and Coeur d'Alene and all the beautiful places. I, I remember going to Spokane with my crew from DC covering the Maryland women, and it was a regional out there. 
And, you know, they'd never seen anything like it. I took them over to Coeur d'Alene and they were like blown away by, you know, the lake and uh, the Coeur d'Alene resort and the mountains and the air and, you know, the water. I mean, I just think when it comes to, to Idaho as a state, obviously it's, it's beautiful. And then when it comes to U of I, um, you just, you just get it all. You get the whole campus life with a great education. And um, for me, I got a great sports experience as well. Well, Kelly, thank you. I know every time we've uh, called upon you, you have said yes without hesitation. The, the, the Vandal family is extremely proud of you and look forward to seeing your success in the future. So I will turn the floor over to uh, Sandy so she can get uh, questions from the audience. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have a few to get through here, so um, we'll try to get to as many as possible. If we don't get to yours, I have them all down and um, I can send them to Kelly and we can try to get through them and get back to you. So. One of the first questions I have is, what is it like to be one of the only women in a male dominant field, field slash environment, personally and professionally? It's a challenge. I mean, I think athletics certainly helped me in the confidence of going in, having a career, um, having my own athletic career has been big for me as well, um, breaking into the industry because, you know, I'm surrounded by a lot of men that they didn't play division one athletics. They didn't have the accomplishments that I have. Um, so that certainly helped me in terms of one, just being an athlete, speaking the language. When you speak the lingo of sports and it's been your whole life, you know, for a woman, everything you say and do in our industry is crit is critiqued. If you make a mistake, if you don't sound like, you know, you know what you're talking about, if you mispronounce someone's name, if you, a lot of those things didn't happen for me because I had such a good background in, in sports. I knew sports, like that's what I knew. People were like, why did you sport? That's what I know. Like, that's what I speak. I speak sports, so that's my game, that's my life. So I think for me, um, you know, naturally everywhere I went, I was the first female sports, you know, anchor or reporter. I was in Medford. I was, Austin had one other female sports reporter. I was an anchor. Um, St. Louis, first female sports. And that was a very Midwest mentality where women necessarily weren't supposed to be talking sports. So I had to win people over. I had to prove myself. And I think in, as a woman in this industry, you're never done proving yourself. You're constantly proving yourself. Every time you open your mouth, you're going to have to show that you know what you're talking about and that you came prepared. So I think women in our industry, there are a lot more now and I've mentored and talked to a lot of them. Alyssa Charleston, of course, she um, has, has been one of um, kind of my, you know, uh, younger selves uh, coming out of basketball and now into our industry. Um, you just, I always tell people, you just gotta, you gotta do the extra work. You gotta be more prepared. You just do. And you just have to make sure that you know, you're ready to back yourself up too, because you will be challenged. I mean, you will be, you know, even if it's, you know, right or wrong, they're, they're going to come at you a little bit different. You're going to get now with social media. I mean, I'm glad I didn't have social media when I started <laughs> in this industry because it's, it's rough. It's brutal. I mean, it gives people a platform to say things, you know, and say anything with no filter. And most of these people that get on social media to criticize you as a woman, have no lives, have no business doing it. You know, it's, um, you see a lot of ugliness. So I just think it's been a challenge for me. I take it on, um, it, you know, my competitiveness and, and my drive to be the best. And I mean, I think I was, when I was in DC and covering the, the Washington football team and the Washington Post did a story on me and they called me a bulldog. So I would go into the locker room and I would just get players and I would dominate and I would just work. I worked so many relationships. I would have people following me around because I was there to do work and get, you know, this player, if I need to talk to this player, I'm going to get this player. Um, so that was probably the biggest compliment to me. And, and that certainly came from my, my father, my parents, both my parents are very strong. Um, and my dad's definitely a bulldog. I'm definitely my father's daughter. Um, but you know, that confidence also from playing for Julie and playing and, and playing sports my whole life. Um, I think it just, you know, helped me, but you know, we, we get judged unfairly and, and it's unfortunate. And we also have to deal with that weird fine line of being, especially when you're young, like I was in, you know, all the way through DC and all that in locker rooms around men. I mean, you've seen a lot of the stories coming out about women being, 
sexually harassed or hit on or whatever, that's something you have to deal with too. You have this weird thing where if you get a, you ask a player for his number because you need that contact, then you have that weird line as if, you know, sometimes they come at you a little strange the way they wouldn't do it with a man. So then you have to like constantly try and keep those professional lines drawn while not bruising an ego of an athlete, which can be difficult. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it was the stories I could tell. I could write a book. There's a lot of them. I'm sure you could. All right. Shifting directions um, away from that a little bit. Being a, This is from Zachary, who I think has to step away, but um, this is recorded so he can watch it. Uh, the voice of the, the Moscow Bears. Being in the industry as long as you have, what has been the most interesting thing to change or forced to adapt to about how things were done in sports broadcasting? Oh, it's definitely social media. Everything is instant. You know, there's... Um, there, you used to like be able to, you know, break stories um, and maybe not not sit on them, but you know, if I had a live shot at six o'clock and I knew something was happening, I could kind of hold it until that six and break the story on the air. You cannot do that now. If you know something, you got to get it out there. Um, and unfortunately, there's there's no checks and balances either. So a lot of people are stealing other people's stories or information and almost putting it out there as if it's their own or as if they, they know it or they've confirmed it. Um, so social media is, it's driven also, I think a lot of the journalism out of our industry, like people, you used to have to work sources. You used to have to like really develop relationships. You used to have to go to games, go in the locker room, see the players, see the coaches, get those like side conversations. Whereas now everyone's sitting on a computer, just reading, you know, Twitter and seeing what everybody else is saying and then jumping on uh, with their own two cents, um, as if they are doing some sort of journalism, like storytelling is going away. I grew up, uh, I mean, I grew up in the industry where I actually had to do packages, as they called it, and stories. And you had to learn to tell a story in a minute and a half with tracks and interviews. And you had to figure out how to tell this story in a very short amount of time. And that's a skill that you have to learn, that storytelling, that ability to write around an interview, um, to put natural sound, we call them nat, nat pops and things like that. Um, all that stuff is kind of, we've lost it. Now everyone's doing podcasts. I mean, how many people need a podcast? Everyone keeps telling me to get a podcast. I'm like, just one more like <laughs> talking head, right? But um, it's, it's definitely... It's definitely changed. I think a lot of that, those relationships that you used to have to form, I don't know if you even get the opportun opportunity to do it anymore because athletes are breaking stories. JJ Watt broke a story yesterday about where he was going. Right. He put it on social media and said, source me, I'm going to Arizona. Right. So you, the athletes don't even need us now to get there. I used to have athletes call me or, or text me and say, hey, this is happening because they wanted it to get out. Right. But, you know, now they just get it out there on their own if they can. Okay. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> uh, from Julia, what advice do you have for current student athletes to help manage time and maximize their performance academically and athletically so they get the most out of their college experience? And I think that's mm -hmm. really important. A oh, great question. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you, you definitely have to I, whew, I sleep, get some sleep. I mean, sleep is so important. It, I mean, you you can't think clearly, you know, retaining information when you're studying becomes hard. I mean, I was lucky that I do my best work at night. Like that's when I study. It wasn't good when I had weights in the morning. Obviously I would then be sleep deprived, but, but I was pretty good at like really crashing for a test and like almost memorizing things and then going in. I can't say it stuck with me for very long. Got me, got me a good grade, but um but I, I do think that you just have to put value in and um, what's in, what's most important, right? I mean, obviously with your team expectations, you have to be at this workout, you have to be at the weights, you have to, you know, maybe do a study hall with the team, or maybe you're the watching tape for, you know, a, a game. Um, you definitely have to prioritize and you have to be organized and you have to like give yourself a break sometimes, you know, you're not perfect. You're not going to get a great grade on everything. Right. Um, but you know, you, you put in the work and, and you just really have to manage, uh, you know, how you, how your day goes, like to make sure that you can get everything in and then also eat. I was not very good at eating, <laughs> like really like stopping and having good nutrients. 
So um, those things you kind of get away with it when you're when you're young, but at the same time, it does affect all your performances. So I don't know. It really is survival when you're an athlete in college and you're trying to get good grades and it's it's a you're in survival mode in a sense, but but you definitely have to be um, disciplined. You can't always go and have fun. It, sometimes you got to like stay in and, and do the work. And I think this, we're going to try to wrap it up on time, but this is, so this will be our last question. And I have, I documented all the other questions, so I'll send them to you. Um, what would you change, if anything, about your sports experience, either playing the game or calling the games? Um, and how has the pressure and stress of playing under such a loud coach, such as Julie Holt, impacted your success nowadays? Uh, okay, the first part was, what would I change? Would you, um, what would you change about your playing or calling the games? your broadcasting experience? Um, hmm, it's a good question. Hmm. Um, I think, gosh, what did I change? I wouldn't change a lot. I mean, I think, you know, I had, I had a great college career. Um, again, I wish, you know, I would have stopped and had a little more fun and, and, and remembered that and remember to just enjoy those moments um, instead of, you know, kind of looking to the next thing. Um, I think for, you know, my career, I, I, I actually, and it's something I might do now that I'm kind of like looking for the next move, um, do some work in, in the broadcast booth, you know, maybe do some play by play, maybe do, um, you know, sideline was never really a thing when I was coming out of college. I wish what I wish is that I came out of college a little bit later when more teams had sideline reporters and more teams had those kind of roles where I could have used my basketball and walked, you know, like Roz Gold on Wood A uh, was basically a Stanford player, star player there. She was able to graduate, get a job with Santa Cruz Warriors, which is the now the G League for, for the Warriors, do sideline for them. And it worked it right into being sideline for the Warriors when they won a championship. I mean, talk about, you know, lucky breaks. Like I would have loved to have come out of college when all these teams had sideline reporters. And, it, and when I came out, it was like, you had Monday Night Football sideline reporters. You had like major network. There weren't a lot of opportunities for that. I wish I could have gone that route. Um, then maybe the way I went, which was through Medford, Oregon and Austin and all these stops, which taught me a lot. And there were great experiences, but I would have jumped right into the game action. I would have done more in the actual live game events. I think that would have been fun, whether that was, you know, as a sideline reporter initially, and then worked my way into the booth, but, but stay tuned. I might, I might try, you know, talking to the PAC 12 about maybe trying to do some play by player analysts for games, which I think would be a fun new challenge. Very good. Thank you very much for um, answering all those questions. I do. Um, I just saw up there that um, our, I want to give a special shout out to Terry Golick. She's our athletic director at the university of Idaho and she has jumped on the call. So I wanted to do a special, uh, shout out to Terry. Terry, it's nice having you here to, to join us today. So, um, thank you, Sandy. Hi, Kelly. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, and that nice about concludes it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just saying nice to meet you, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, Kelly, Kelly. Nice Terry. to meet you as well. Great job. I loved your answers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that about wraps it up for our questions today, Kelly. We're thrilled to have you today and thank you for taking the time out to join us today. And uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for, for the interview. Um, we really appreciate it, so. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, congrats, Mahmoud, on your two-year anniversary. I think I saw that yesterday, right? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. We'll and thanks for everyone the, for uh, coming on. I appreciate we'll everyone. Go Vandals, on. Kelly, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, go Vandals. All right. Thank you. Good job, everybody. Thanks. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.